React.js. The library which changed front-end development with concepts such as Virtual DOM, State Management, JSX or Hooks. Despite it being launched back in 2013, it still has an active and engaged dev community while also being the most used library for building single-page applications. To get started, you'll need Node.js and npm installed on your local environment. Next, run the npx create react app command in a terminal and we are ready to start writing code. I advise you to use TypeScript in all your projects because its long-term gains are undeniable. Once npm finishes installing all the dependencies, which could take up to a couple of minutes, you'll end up with the following project structure. Of course, we are going to mostly work in the source folder, but the public folder is also worth mentioning. Here, you'll find static assets like the app icons, the default HTML page, which is loaded into the browser before the React app is rendered, the manifest JSON file if you want to make your app progressive, and of course, the robots.txt file used by crawlers to scan and index your website. The entry point into the application is the index.tsx file, where you can see the app component rendered in a DOM element with the root ID. It's always a good practice to wrap your code into the React strict mode component so that React can highlight potential problems in your application at development time. Finally, like in all Node projects, you'll find a package.json file where project metadata, dependencies and build scripts can be found. Let's start our app by simply running npm start. After a couple of seconds, you'll be able to reach the default app in your browser by accessing the local host at port 3000. Since version 16.8, React offers hooks, one of the biggest changes introduced in the library since it was released. The main goal of the hooks is to allow you to handle state and other React features by using functions instead of classes to define components. I advise you to only use function-based components since it drastically reduces the boilerplate code, it makes things easier to reuse and it decreases the number of API-specific methods you need to know. Let's create two folders in the source directory. We'll store our React components in the folder with the same name and we'll create a domain folder where we'll store any object or interface we need for our business logic. Since we are building the usual to-do app, we'll need a task structure we can play around with. In most scenarios, you'll need a simple way to define the structure for your data and I find it more flexible to use interfaces instead of classes. As a bonus, TypeScript interfaces are not transpiled into the resulting JS file so the generated code is shorter. Next, we declare the tasks array. We'll also enforce the type to make sure TypeScript is validating our code. This will also help us with code auto-completion in a few seconds. It's also time to write some JSX. In short, this is a template language which helps us mix the known HTML tags with JavaScript. The resulting output are the DOM components React will render in the browser. We'll iterate over the tasks list and map each object to a resulting list element. For now, we are simply displaying the name and the description here, but we'll get into some more details a little bit later. Now that we've seen how to display elements in the page, let's also interact with the DOM. We'll start by adding a button in our app and then register a non-click event. The event handler is a simple function defined inside the component. We want to add a new task in the existing list when we click the button, but notice that this is not working as expected. This simple scenario gives us a chance to jump into one of the core features of React, hooks. So, while the task array is being updated and new elements are pushed into it, React doesn't know that it needs to trigger a new render and to update the DOM based on the latest values inside the task list. To solve this, we'll need to define the list of tasks as a state value of the app component. We'll be using the useState hook to do this, which is simply a function which takes the default value as a parameter, in our case an empty array, and returns an array containing the state value and the setter we'll look into in just a second. We are using the useEffect hook to initialize the state array with some values. Notice the empty array passed as the second parameter for this hook. React will know to monitor changes for any state or property defined in this array and it will run the code again anytime any of those monitored values will change. In our case, we are passing an empty dependency array, which means that the code inside the hook will be executed only once when the component is first rendered. Next, it's time to use the state setter I mentioned earlier. Always use the setter when modifying a state value. Also, make sure you are passing in a new reference to the setter, since this is what React compares to understand what values have been changed. In the case of arrays, just pushing a new element in an existing array is not enough, since the array will still have the same reference in memory. To fix this, we are using array destructuring to create a clone of the existing array and we'll add a new element at the end. We've talked about state values, it's time now to take a look at a different type of data in React. Props. These are values which are passed around between components, so let's start by creating a component designed to render each task entry in the DOM. By the way, it's a good practice to keep your components as small and as specialized as possible. 
Again, properties are values which are passed down from a parent component to a child component. Whenever any of these property values change in the parent component, a render will be triggered on the child component. While components can change their own state values, they cannot change prop values. A prop change can only happen in the parent component. Since we are using TypeScript, we can define a task entity props interface so that we clearly specify the type of the properties our task entry component can receive. We'll move the name and the description elements from the parent component into the child task entry and we'll pass the task object as a property. Whenever you are iterating over a list of objects and mapping those to DOM elements, always pass a unique key for each entry. This helps React perform DOM updates in an efficient manner. In our example, we don't want the library to re-render the whole list of DOM elements when a new entry is added in the array. We want React to efficiently add the required DOM elements while keeping the existing ones intact. In a real-life scenario, you'll most likely get an ID for each entry from a backend API which will use the same ID to identify the object in the database. In our example, we'll just use some dummy data we know for certain will be unique. In the app.css file, we can easily add styling rules to make the tasks look a little bit better. We'll not go into any details here since this has nothing to do with React, but you'll find a link in the description to a quick CSS guide if you'll need it. One topic I want to touch on here though is React support for SAS. If you don't know it by now, SAS is a very powerful tool which makes writing CSS much easier. We can add this into our project by simply running an npm install command. Once installed, simply change your CSS file extension to scss. By simply doing this, you can now write sass instead and use cool features like rule nesting, variables or mixins. This is the first part of a free React tutorial I'm working on. Please like this video if you found it useful and subscribe to the channel to be notified when the next part of the series will be released.